So welcome everyone to our final lecture of the spring series. Uh, we are welcoming John Babin from the Maine Historical Society tonight, and his topic is about the fireside poets. Um, so take it away. Thank you. Today, we're going to discuss the fireside poets. <clears throat> Who were these poets? What was their style of poetry? The effect it had on its readers? And last, I'm going to talk about a couple of Longfellow's literary relationships and a little about the Portland home where I work. So, the Fireside Poets. Who were these five men with three names? The Fireside Poets, also called the schoolroom or household poets, were the first group of American poets to rival British poets in popularity in either country referred also as the schoolroom poets because paintings of these five poets were hung in schools. The other term used for these poets was the household poets. Like the fireside poets, the term meant that there was read in the home, mostly by night by the fire. These poets, general adherence to poetic convention, Standard forms, regular meter, rhyme stanzas, made their body of work particularly suitable for memorization and recitation in schools and at home. The poet's primary subjects were domestic life, mythology, and politics of the United States, in which several of them were directly involved. In the 1888 book, Literature in Schools, by Horace Scudder, he wrote, they were born on American soil. They have breathed American air. They were nurtured on American ideas. They are Americans of Americans. William Cullen Bryan, born November 3rd, 1794 in Cummington, Massachusetts, died June 12th, 1878 in New York City. A poet of nature best remembered for Thanatopsis and an editor for 50 years at the New York Evening Post. Thanatopsis, the Greek word meaning view on death, was written by Bryant at the age of 17 and published in the North American Review in 1817, giving him instant fame. Other works include Consumption, To a Waterfowl, Summer Wind, A Forest Hymn, The Death of Flowers, and A Winter Peace. John Greenleaf Whittier, born December 17, 1807 in Haverhill, Massachusetts, died September 7, 1892 in Hampton Falls, New Hampshire. The most outspoken of the fireside poets on social progressive beliefs they all shared in a career of the reverse of William Cullen Bryant's, Whittier was a newspaper editor in the cause of abolitionists first and a poet second. Whittier's opposition grew out of his Quaker background. The Quakers had themselves been oppressed in both Old and New England and had early set themselves opposed to slavery, a history Whittier presents in the Pennsylvania Pilgrim, 1872. Other well-known works, Snowbound, A Winter Idol, Telling the Bees, and Ichabod. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, born February 27, 1807, in Portland, Maine, died March 21st, 1882, in his home in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Wrote his first published poem at the age of 13, graduated from the Portland Academy a private high school at the age of 14 and started to attend Bowdoin College here in Maine. The first year of their college career, that's Henry, his older brother, Stephen, and the neighbor's son, Ned Preble, all studied in Portland at the Portland Academy. Henry's parents thought Henry much too young for college life at 14. He was part of the Bowdoin graduating class of 1825. And at the age of 32, he would publish his first book of poems called Voices of the Night. 
Just eight years later, at the age of 40, Evangeline was published. It is this work that made him a figure in the world of literature. Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., born August 29, 1809 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, died October 7, 1894 in Boston, Massachusetts. Best known for Old Ironsides, 1836, Home was American physician, a poet, a polymath based in Boston. A member of the Fireside Poets, he was acclaimed by his peers as one of the best writers of his day. His most famous prose works are the Breakfast Table series, which began with the autocrat of the breakfast table. In addition to his work as an author and poet, Holmes also served as a physician, a professor, a lecturer, and an inventor. And he also never practiced, but received a formal education in law. James Russell Lowell, born February 22nd, 1819 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, died August 12th, 1891 in Cambridge. He was an American poet, a critic, an editor, an education, and a diplomat. Best known for the Big Low Papers, other poems by Lowell included Above and Beyond, A Stanza of Freedom, The First Snowfall, A Letter, and The Search. He taught at Harvard, editor of the Atlantic Monthly, and appointed the ambassadorship to the Kingdom of Spain. I'm randomly picked these stanzas from poems and I'm gonna read them and I'm gonna read them all together. And then what I'm gonna do after is I'm going to tell you the name of the poem and the writer, okay? But the rowan mixed with weeds, tingle tufts from marsh and meads, where the poppies drop its seeds in silence and the gloom. The coming of the snowstorm told the best wind blew east. We heard the roar of ocean on his wintry shore. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's roar. The meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. I stood and watched by the window the noiseless work of the sky and the sudden flurries of snowbirds like brown leaves whirling by. Yet a few sunny days in which the bee shall murmur by the hedge that skirts the way, the critic chirp upon the russet lay, and man delight to linger in thy lay. So, as you can hear from the readings, the conventional poetic forms the fireside poets used standard forms, regular forms, rhyme stanzas, made these poets the most popular writers of the 19th century. So I started off with Aftermath by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but the Rowan mixed with the weaves, tangled tufts from the Martian meads, where the poppies drop its seeds in silence and in gloom. The second was Snowbound, John Green, Greenleaf Whittier. The coming of the snowstorm told, the wind blew east. We heard the roar of the ocean on its wintry shore. And then I went into all of the Wendell Holmes' old Ironsides. Beneath it rung the battle shout and burst the cannon's war. The meteor, meteor of the ocean air shall sweep the clouds no more. James Russell Lowell's The First Snowfall, I stood and watched by the window, the noiseless work of the sky and the sudden flurries of snowbirds like brown leaves whirling by. And I ended with William Cullen Bryant's November, yet a few sunny days in which the bee shall murmur by the hedge that skirts the way, the cricket chirp upon the russet lay and man delight to linger in thy lay. 
Now I'd like to talk just a little bit about some of the literary relationships that Longfellow had. Um, these writers um, were actually inspired by Longfellow. And the first one I'm gonna talk about was Nathaniel Hawthorne. Nathaniel Hawthorne was born July 4th, 1804 in Salem, Massachusetts, died May 19th, 1864 in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Best known for the Scarlet Letter in 1850 in the House of Seven Gables in 1851, Nathaniel Hawthorne and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow both graduated from Bowdoin College as part of the class of 1825. But they were not friends. Their friendship started when it was launched by Hawthorne in March of 1837. In a brief letter addressed to Dear Sir, in signed your obedient servant, the occasion, Hawthorne's per first publication a book called Twice Told Tales. He arranged for Longfellow to receive a copy and wrote, I venture to request your acceptance. We were not, it is true, so well acquainted at college, yet I can plead an absolute right to inflict my twice told tediousness on you. But I have often regretted that we were not better known to each other and have been glad of your success in literature in more important matters. I know not whether you are aware that I have made a good many idle attempts in the way of magazine and annual scribblings. The present volume contains such articles as seem best to offer to the public a second time. And I should like to flatter myself that those tales would repay you some part of the pleasure which I have derived from your own entree mare, Longfellow's first long prose work. Almost immediately, Longfellow sent a long and warm reply. Later, Longfellow reviewed on the book, Twice Told Tales, began with the lofty image of Hawthorne as a new star rising in the heavens. Then he defined him as a man of genius. And so began the long friendship. Charles Dickens, born February 7th, 1812, died June 9th, 1870. The English writer and social critic, he created some of the world's best known fictional characters and is regarded by many as the greatest novelist of the Victorian era best known for A Christmas Carol, Oliver Twist, Great Expectations, David, David Copperfield, and A Tale of Two Cities. Dickens and Longfellow became very close friends from the time of his arrival to America in 1842 and until Longfellow's final visit to Gads Hill shortly before Dickens' death. In a letter to Longfellow, Dickens writes, how stands it about your visit? Do you say, thus your bed is waiting to be slept in, the door is gaping hospitality to receive you. I am ready to spring towards it with open arms and at the first indication of a Longfellow knock or ring. Longfellow would later write of his visit. In London, I stayed with Dickens, had a very pleasant visit. His wife is a gentle, lovely character, and he has four children, all beautiful and good. After hearing about the death of Dickens in 1870, Longfellow wrote in his journal, I can't think of nothing else, but see him lying there dead in the house at Gads Hill, silent and motionless. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Henry Wadsworth's life in Portland. And I bring up Robert Frost because Robert Frost's first book was entitled A Boy's Will. And that was from the poem, My Lost Youth. And in the lines of My Lost Youth, a boy's will is a wind's will and thoughts of youth along long thoughts. And I always remember that when I, I do tours um, 
of the house when I'm, I'm doing book tours and I tell about the Portland house. I always say, if you want to become acquainted with the Longfellow house and you want to know what his life here was in Portland, just read one poem and that poem would be My Lost Youth. And My Lost Youth was a poem that was written by Longfellow after he, he was grown, he was living at Cambridge, he was teaching at Harvard, and he made visits annually back to Portland and wrote some of his most famous works here. And on one occasion, he just strolled through the town and a few years later, he just woke up from a dream remember, remembering the visit and he wrote the poem, My Lost Youth. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's life in Portland. This is the home that he grew up in, the Longfellow House. It was built by General Peleg Wadsworth, Henry's grandfather. Peleg and his wife, Elizabeth, brought up 10 children in this eight room house. You look back at the house and you see it today and it has a third story on it. Um, that particular third story was added when Henry was a child and it's from the bedroom that Henry could look right out onto the harbor and see all the way out to the Portland headlight. So the home originally built back in 1785, 1786 by Peleg, the home is brick and the brick was actually imported up from Philadelphia. Henry's parents were Stephen and Zilpa Longfellow. They raised eight children in the home that Zilpa grew up in. And the children had a saying about their, their names in the, the area and time of their birth. And the eight children would say, Stephen and Henry, Stephen and Henry, Ellen and Sam. And they would go on and, and tell the birth dates. Um, so it was, it was a little saying that the children had. The home was left to the Maine Historical Society by Anne Longfellow Pierce. And Anne was Henry's younger sister, um, just as though um, Elizabeth Whittier was John Greenleaf's younger sister. And um, they both really cherished the, the, the friendship and love they had for each other. Um, and Anne, like Elizabeth, was very, very close to Henry. Anne Longfellow Pierce has a great story of her own. Anne Longfellow Pierce grew up in this home and she was only away from it for three years when she was married to George Washington Pierce, who was a classmate of Henry's at Bowdoin College. He died of the typhus epidemic and in the three years of marriage, Anne and George had no children Anne would return back to the home. Anne would live here until she died in the home at the age of 90, back in 1901. But six years prior to Anne's death, she got together with the Maine Historical Society. She said, I will leave you the home in all its contents if you turn this home into a museum in honor of my famous brother, the poet. Why was this so important to Anne? It's because Anne said that not only did Henry write his first published poem in the home at 13, but he continued to continually work and write on poetry. Even after he was grown and had a family of his own, he would return to the home at least once a year, if not more. And Anne said some of the most famous poems were written in the home. So the home is a virtual time capsule. When you walk into the home today, what you see are all the original furnishings and actually left eight pages of instructions on how things in the home would never be touched or never be moved. And her eight pages of instructions are followed to this day. So when you walk into the house, it's a virtual time capsule, capsule all the original artwork all the original furnishings, all the original china, knickknacks, clocks, lamps are in this home. So that's what you see when you go into the Longfellow home. So here's a picture right here of the Longfellow desk that Henry worked on a number of different projects on, but wrote a very famous poem called The Rainy Day. And his second book, Hyperion, was written on this desk. 
Henry Wadsworth Longfellow went on to become one of the most famous poets of the 19th century, along with the fireside poets. Um, and basically, it was just a great story about the fireside poets. They really wrote for the common man. They really wrote for the family. And you can hear that in, in the poetry, in the stories that they told. Um, I really enjoyed talking about the fireside poets and Henry's home here in Portland. And what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to say thank you. And if we have any questions, feel free to fire away. Thank you so much. That was great. I was taking notes on some of them. Um, Linda, do you have any questions before I ask any of mine? All right. Um, so the one thing that popped out in my head when you were talking about his sister and Longfellow Pierce, um, I'm wondering if her husband's family is related to Franklin Pierce, who I know also went to Bowdoin, and maybe there's that connection. So they are distant, distant cousins, but became very, very close friends. Okay. Yes, both George and Franklin, yes. But we, we've looked into it and if they were related, it was like fourth or fifth cousin, something like that, yeah. I, yeah. I know they were kind of you know around the same time period too. So maybe they were brothers is what I was thinking, but they, you know, obviously not. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other thing I had that was popping into my mind is that I, so when I was looking at colleges and I toured Bowdoin's campus, they pointed out the dorm room that Longfellow um, lived in and Hawthorne lived in. Apparently it was the same room and they comment that everybody else that has stayed in that room has become an English major since then. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> that, that's a great story. I never knew that because I, when, I, when I go out and talk about it, I, I talk about how the first year that Henry attended Bowdoin College that the dorm was full and he had to actually stay in the home of the local Reverend Tinkham. And that home later became the Harriet Beecher um, house. Okay, oh. where she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. So is the Portland house open to the public? It will be open in mid June. We're still um, closed due to COVID. And with all the changing regulations, we're really trying to catch up and figure out exactly how many people we can bring into the house at one time, uh, make sure that we have proper ventilation um, in the home. So we're, we're still a little behind. We were hoping to be open sooner. But um, like I said, as regulations keep changing, we have to keep changing our protocol. So. We're aiming for we're aiming for mid June, hopefully June 9th at, at the earliest. So just well, check on our website, or feel free to give us a call, and uh, we'll let you know for sure. But our brand new exhibit, Begin Again, just opened today. Uh, Begin Again um, is titled Begin Again: Reckoning with um, Intolerance in Maine. So that's our brand new exhibit. I look forward to going there. Yeah, that sounds excellent. It's been a few years since I've been up to visit. Um, so I look forward to coming back and seeing your new exhibits. Well, thank you very much. Uh, any other final words? I thank you so much. I really appreciated this. And I, I, it's got me inspired to check out, especially Longfellow, some of his poetry that I hadn't really looked at before. So thank you. You're welcome. I just want to put on the record that our next uh, virtual lecture for the Whittier Birthplace is going to be in September. We're taking the summer off. And then in September, our speakers are going to be talking about another fireside poet. Um, this time, our theme will be William Cullen Bryant. So check back in um, in September for our next virtual lecture series. Great job, Kaylee. Thank you so much. Kaylee, thank you so much for having me. Really thank, you. thank you, John, for yeah, really zooming down it. from Maine. Thank you.